Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. I'm here with my two guests today. I'm Dr. Heather Schaefer, a primary care sports medicine physician at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Keene. And I'm Tate Erickson. I'm the sports medicine manager at Cheshire Medical Center, Dartmouth Hitchcock Keene. And today we're going to talk about concussions, head injuries, something that's getting a lot of press um, lately. And we've had some, we just recently had a football player that committed suicide. It seems possibly from as a result of numerous concussions and the other problems. But what is a concussion? How would you notice it? Uh, the most recent definition of concussion is uh, dysfunction in the brain in response to some sort of trauma, usually trauma to the head, but if you get enough force of hit to the body that transmits <laughs> enough force to the head, you can also have a concussion. And <clears throat> we always talk about adults and athletes. Is concussion age-related? It can be. Uh, some of the latest evidence is suggesting that the younger you are, probably the more, uh, the more severe concussion can be, and actually the longer the recovery can be, which is somewhat opposite from a lot of other types of more severe brain injury. Uh, it can occur at any age, though. So uh, most of the research right now is probably in the young athletes, the adolescent population. But again, I see all ages. Because I've looked back at even some of my baby pictures, some of the grandkids and other ones, and you, you see kids with a big noggin on their head, black and blue, kind of bump out there, like a horn growing. And they say, oh, no big deal. Just let the kid go to sleep and everything's okay. Uh, in the old days, yeah, that, that probably was because that was all we knew. Uh, all we knew was we did a CAT scan or we did an MRI and we don't see any kind of bleed in the brain or anything like that. So we don't really know what it is. Go home, they'll be okay. And we've learned so much more, even just in the last five years, the research on concussion has exploded. Uh, and that definition of concussion has really been solidified a little bit more. You know, we, we have the group of symptoms that we know to watch for. We have uh, a better understanding of the natural course of the recovery and what to watch for through the recovery, too. Football players is sports medicine. Where you go in, it's like if you didn't get cold cocked and you didn't pounce right up, you just went a football player. The idea was just get right back in. What's some of the um, potential problems with that? I think that being 2011, 2010, last year football season, that we have to take everything uh, much more serious nowadays when a kid does get cold cocked per se and they come off the field and they stop uh, recognizing or not recognizing where they're at or what the score is. So we do a lot of what we would call an on-field assessment and, and try to rule out concussion immediately. And I think the difference between now and maybe even five years ago uh, with especially football is if a kid is showing any sign of concussion, uh, they're out of that game, and they are then uh, brought into one of our uh, treatment rooms and uh, during that game or after that game, and we speak directly with our parents here in this community, and we talk to them about concussion and try to educate. I think that's the biggest piece nowadays is education about what a concussion is and how serious it is to have something called second impact syndrome if we were allow them to go back into that game that night. So five, six years ago, we might have maybe done a little bit of on-field assessment for 5, 10, 15 minutes, and if their symptoms went away, they could go back in the game. Nowadays, they are out of that game, and we bring them through a lot of neurocognitive testing and physical exertion tests before they're allowed to go back to play. So that's a big difference be, you know, from five, six years ago. Is there any difference in the severity of the concussion if an individual gets knocked out compared to not getting knocked out? Uh, we've found a lot less correlation between a brief <clears throat> loss of consciousness and recovery or time of recovery. Um, it, it doesn't pan out real well. So does it worry me a lot more if I hear that they lost consciousness briefly? Not really. The, um, <clears throat> I spent a, a lot of time in the Marine Corps, 21 years, and I was a combat engineer in it just didn't dawn on me all the time until I was reading some of the articles. The concussion effect, concussion. But when we were do, doing planning on landmines or whatever, we always thought, thought about the killing ratio based on concussion and shockwaves. 
and it was kind of like now, and I guess they're getting with Afghanistan. When you're planning shock waves, you can get a concussion without actually having a physical injury. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. There's a lot of that physics in what can the body take and how much of that force gets transmitted into the brain to cause that dysfunction on really a molecular level. Uh, it's, again, as I mentioned before, our imaging tests are going to be normal. But on the molecular level, some of the things that they've used in research to look at that, the brain's not functioning right. Uh, electrolytes are kind of <laughs> knocked out of whack, um, and some of the neurotransmitters are really knocked out of whack, and so the brain just can't respond like it normally would, even with those <laughs> other transmitted forces. So. You were talking about the, the effects of the body going up. So if, if I got into a, a car accident, and I just, my head snapped back and forth, but quote unquote, I didn't hit my head on anything. Could that have an, an impact on my brain? It's very possible. Uh, and especially depending on the characteristics of the person to begin with. We are learning more. There are some genetic factors that are starting to come out as maybe a possibility uh, at, towards susceptibility to concussion. Um, previous concussions, migraine, headache, uh, there are a lot of factors that I look at that may make people more susceptible to a concussion or are going to play a role in, in a slower recovery also. We go back to sports. What about the, the parents? If you look at Little League and stuff and you get these parents a gun hole, gun hole, pushing, are you having trouble with, with some of the parents wanting to get their kids right back into the game quick or trying to get that pressure it's no big deal, it's no big deal. I played with one when I was a kid. I think that it's becoming a little bit less of an issue than it was two, three years ago because of how much education and media <clears throat> attention concussion is getting when you're watching ESPN and uh, you're seeing NFL new policies and procedures. Major League Baseball yeah. just came out with a new policy within the past two weeks on return to play. So I think when parents are watching what's going on in the national and professional level and they realize that that's going on here in the community level as well, and then when we tell them it's a little bit more serious when it's a younger age kid versus a professional aged athlete and that the symptoms can last a little bit longer, and we talk to them about second impact syndrome, I think they start to realize that it, this is a, a brain injury when you're talking about the definition of a concussion. That's really how we like to put it to the parents is that it's a brain injury. And if this brain injury occurs again on top of the first one, then we're really going to have some serious issues. And then when it's your own child, you start thinking, okay, I need to make good decisions based on the education that I'm receiving from our sports medicine staff. And that, I think that's really where we're at in 2011. There's always going to be one or two parents that want their kid to play, but I think when they realize that this is an actual brain injury and we need to treat it throughout their entire day, school and sports, that they understand that it's very serious. And that, that, my, that theory of my kid needs to, to get in the game right away kind of gets thrown out the window. When you're talking about <coughs> sports, we're always looking at, at football, but it seems that hockey is having more and more concussions. And even this year, the NBA says, well, we need to have a concussion policy, but holy crap, we have more basketball players suffering concussions. So is it, is it coming easier to bring it across sports? I think that concussion has always been defined in collision sports. Uh, and there are NCAA and professional uh, guidelines based on what's considered a high risk a sport and a low risk sport and we do see concussions in low risk sports and I think that with all the attention and all the research that's been going into concussion we're realizing that not only does concussion happen in ice hockey and football and lacrosse but also in basketball and also you know in baseball and in sports that are considered a little bit lower risk than high impact sports and that just comes with with all of the knowledge that we're gaining and research that we're doing do you think that's fair? I think we've seen them, um, you know, certainly, yes, those purposeful collision sports are the highest risk, but I think we've seen concussions coming out of every sport that we cover. The, um, <clears throat> I had told you before offline that I've had a number of concussions. I think I'm in my seventh one, and I've got traumatic brain injury. Not something to brag about, but <clears throat> I suffered a major concussion in January this year, and I thought I was doing really good. And then all of a sudden, the third day, I'm at the hospital, and all of a sudden, everything was just a complete collapse. I, 
was kind of like being one of those um, football players that got up and just wiggly, everything just went. So my daughter's a nurse, and she kept saying, Dad, you got to go to the doctor, you got to go to the doctors. But I thought I was feeling better the day after. But how long can it be? How long should someone should be watched? If you had your child had to suffer a head injury in, in a football game, how long do you think you should watch him before? It, maybe we've got to go back to the doctors. I think that's what's interesting about concussion in 2011 is that there's no, there's no timeline we can put on recovery right now. We're treating every patient individually, just like we do with a lot of diagnoses. But for years, we never did. We graded concussions, grades one, two, and three. We put a timeline on them. And at that timeline, no matter what, that kid went back to play. Now we're treating each patient based on symptoms and then based on exertion. So all the symptoms are gone. And if we have neurocognitive testing, which I'm sure we'll get into, uh, which is impact testing we use in this area, um, then we use those results along with what you're telling us your symptoms are. And then we bring you through some type of exertion because all those molecular level things Dr. Schaefer was speaking of change with exertion. And if all those things are back to homeostasis, then we let people like yourself go back to doing activities that you would like to do. But if the next person is going to take longer, then we treat the patient, the next person, just as on the same level as you, where we're going to make sure symptoms are gone, we're going to make sure you can exert without having symptoms, and we're going to make sure that everyday living is good, like eating in school or work or whatever it might be. And again, five, six years ago, that was not the case. That's good. Like Dr. Long, the neurologist, it's, I feel really good, but if I go out for a long walk, everything... Co- Comes, comes back, and I'm saying, wait a minute, that was two months ago. It shouldn't be, and it would be so easy now in the past for me not to connect either one of them because it's right. been such a big gap. But that's, that's where the importance <clears throat> of treating each individual comes in. Each brain is different. Each history is different. I spend usually close to a good hour with folks in the office when they come in for that initial visit to, to assess their concussion because there's so many different factors that I'm taking into consideration to try to help predict their recovery. But in reality, it's a tough thing to predict. I, I've seen folks ready to go in a few days, and I've seen folks hang on for months and months and months. Um, and it's also somewhat difficult to assess because so much is based on the symptoms uh, and, and how you're feeling that uh, it, it's difficult. You know, doctors, we like to have a blood test and be able to say normal or abnormal. But uh, in concussion, there's, there's a wide range of different ways it can present, a wide range of different symptoms. And it really, for the health of your brain for the long term, to p- try to prevent some of that cumulative injury as much as possible, the important thing is that we get you back to your brain telling us it's 100% healed before we let you go back to regular life and overstressing and and all of those things. Um, Actually, that's the other thing I was going to say. On that that molecular level, I'm on a roll, so (laughs) why not? Uh, (laughs) On that molecular level, part of the the problem is the brain, with all those things kind of out of whack, the brain starts screaming for energy to try and heal itself. At the same time, it loses its ability to control its own own blood supply. So now you have this big disconnect between the supply it's screaming for, uh, or the the energy it's screaming for, and being able to get that supply there. Um, So I I think that brings me to one of the most important things that we're doing with concussion now also as far as treatment. I don't have a drug that fixes that yet. Maybe we will someday. Uh, but so that's why I emphasize rest, rest, rest. You noticed that I was feeling pretty good, but I went for a walk and, oh, my symptoms were back. And it's, it's that stress on the brain that can kick, kick those symptoms back up and slow the recovery. So we need to rest, brain rest and body rest to let the brain recover. And then 95% of the time, the brain will recover on its own if it's a concussion. I've noticed maybe that when you, someone has a concussion or a head injury, you bring in the, um, the family members more often and start talking to them. And it's kind of like, shut up. I know what I'm talking about, it seems, but you're getting a heck of a lot more imp- input from the family members, people around them. Definitely. Not only 
you know, I, I always ask my patient first because I want to see what they remember about the injury. But then to fill in some of the history details from the family member is very helpful. And the other important thing with the family is that first visit, I'm throwing a lot of this information at them. Uh, as Tate said, we, we really are doing as much education as we possibly can. For me, in the office, giving lectures in the community, Tate giving lectures in the community and talking to coaches and administration. Um, and so, you know, all of this information thrown at them on the injured brain patient, yeah, they're, they're not going to absorb that very well. So the family members to help kind of absorb and hopefully get everybody on the same page for recovery from that injury and hopefully recognizing any future injuries is important. You were talking about the, the testing. That goes along with your saying is everybody's brain's different, everybody takes impact differently and heals different. So you're doing, what type of testing you're doing to create a baseline? It's a, a test out of University of Pittsburgh Medical Center called impact testing. <clears throat> and the four high schools we cover in this area, uh, Keene High, Monadnock High, and Fall Mountain, and Bellows Falls, all utilize this impact testing from University of Pittsburgh. And it's neurocognitive <laughs> testing that tells us where their brain is at when they are not concussed. So we typically get a baseline test in the beginning of a season. So whether it's fall, winter, or spring, that baseline test is usually good for two years if they do not have a concussion as an athlete. If they get, a, if they get concussed, then we bring them in within 24 hours in one of our high school programs and we retest them and compare the results to their baseline scores. Dr. Schaefer, we're very fortunate to have her here as a primary care sports medicine doc because she is very good at interpreting these results. Many times, neuropsychologists across the nation are the ones that interpret these. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have her here because if we just use this testing, we would be calling University of Pittsburgh or Dartmouth <laughs> to have a neuropsychologist interpret the, the test scores for us. And sometimes we still do, but Dr. Schaefer, the majority of the time, can look at these and, and use it as a tool. And that's the biggest point that I can make is this is just a tool that tells us where their brain is at neurocognitively. What's most important, as Dr. Schaefer was stating, is you telling us how your brain is feeling or how your family members are telling us how you're acting around the house and how your sleep is doing and do you have any underlying pathologies such as learning disabilities or ADHD or anything like that because that will affect your concussion as well. Um, but back to the impact testing, it's just a really nice tool to have because it gives us numbers compared to something that they took during preseason when they do have a concussion. And pretty much every professional sport is using impact testing right now from football all the way down to Major League Baseball and basketball. The, um, <coughs> I can't remember, I think it was about a year, year and a half ago, Sports Illustrated had this um, article concerning concussions. I think it was a school out in Iowa, and I think there was one out in Chicago. They had used the impact testing you're talking about. And what, I guess what surprised them was they were looking at the big guys the big forceful ones that would have the most damage, but there were some some of the kids who didn't have all that forceful impact, but at the end, they seemed to have suffered more damage than the people that you expected to suffer damage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. again, there are factors about different brains that maybe we don't even know yet uh, as far as the, the risk of an individual person having a concussion. And sometimes it's how the hit occurs, some of the rotational type forces seem to actually be worse than some of the straight head-on things. Um, so y you just never know. How does the hit occur? What's that person's kind of underlying constitution or brain history? Um, yeah, it, it can occur for anybody. And I think being aware of it, being aware of the symptoms and you know recognizing it and acknowledging it uh, for the kids to tell us uh, and and let us know when these kinds of symptoms and things are happening so we can help protect their brains for the future I think is very important. The um, <clears throat> New Hampshire about four years ago finally got a, a bike helmet law for 16 and below. I don't know if either one were you hit, but has that made um, a big difference in the number of children that's coming into the hospital with head injuries? I can't answer that. I honestly what? don't know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I honestly don't know. I can say equipment in general is, I mean, is good. You obviously <laughs> want to use the equipment that's recommended for whatever activity you're doing. 
Uh, concussion is still tough, though. Um, we certainly decrease skull fractures, brain bleeds, you know, more severe types of, of brain injury. But a concussion, it's important to understand a concussion can still occur even when you're wearing that helmet or even if you bought that most expensive, perfect football helmet for your little guy, uh, you can still get a concussion. If, if I was like the actress and I was going skiing and I hit my head and I thought was really no big deal, what would be the symptoms of, of a bleeder that someone, of someone should, a parent or a, should pick up on? That's the tough thing with that specific type of hit is it can be fairly silent until it's almost too late. Fairly silent. Um, I, the way I handle these, say I'm on the sideline covering a football game, if I have time to watch someone on the sideline do a really good detailed neurologic exam, uh, and I can watch them for a while, say they get hit in the first quarter, I'm going to feel fairly good sending that kid home, assuming all my evaluation has been pretty normal, uh, sending that kid home and, and feel fairly comfortable. The first 24 to 48 hours after any type of head injury can be kind of dangerous, like, like the actress. Um, so it, it, symptoms to watch for, um, you know, basically anything that indicates that the brain is not functioning right. And so that can be not responding normally, not thinking normally, uh, you know, words coming out funny or not coming out at all. Um, it can even just be dizziness, visual problems, numbness, tingling, weakness, any of those kinds of brain functions that go wrong, say you need to get checked out immediately. Uh, and ideally, any kind of serious head injury, someone with training in head injury or concussion uh, evaluation should be taking a look at that person. What about... Um some of the people sometimes seem to have these weird mood swings or violent outbursts after having some head injuries. Is that a result or can it be a result of those? Mood effects definitely go along with concussion. Uh, the kids that I generally see in the office and that, you know, that they see at the high schools, when they first come in, they are masked. You know, they are just depressed looking. Um, not a whole lot of, you know, not a whole lot of laughing, um, none of that stuff. They're, they're just pretty, pretty socked in. And it's very interesting for me to watch in the office, um, not knowing the kids at baseline usually, to watch the personality come back as they recover. Um, and, and that is a, a pretty common pattern. Now, that's with a single concussion. A lot of the NFL things and, you know, the, the more long-term there can certainly be some of those mood effects from repetitive concussions, especially if they aren't treated properly. So if we don't let the brain recover 100% before we go back and we're getting knocked around again, uh, you know, they're, they're actually finding patterns in these people's brains that are very closely related to dementia. Uh, so, When you're talking about <clears throat> dementia, the Wall Street Journal last year had the article concerning Lou Gehrig's disease and saying maybe Lou Gehrig didn't die from um, <clears throat> Lou Gehrig's disease but multiple concussions. And it was talking about one game he just got whacked on the head, had a big noggin, and he got up, played the rest of the game, and continued on with his streak. But as it kept going back, over, some, he suffered a ser number of serious head injuries from a ball going 90 miles an hour. Yeah, the, the cumulative effect of those <clears throat> untreated concussions or multiple hits still on the injured brain, uh, I think we are getting much more documentation of that and much more research into that. So hopefully that will help us with our battle also of recognizing and acknowledging each injury when it happens and being willing to treat it properly. Um, a lot of kids don't bring their <laughs> symptoms to us because, hey, I just want to play. And I always tell them, I'm a sports doc. 
I want you to play. I love sports. That's why I'm here. But I want you to play safely. And, you know, it's definitely my job to kind of think of the long-term health of the brain and, and do what we need to do to protect it. We've actually found that treating the way we treat now as opposed to when we used to just, oh, standard, two weeks you're out, three weeks you're out. Um, treating the way we treat now, we actually get kids back quicker to the game than, than the way we used to, and yet a lot safer. The, uh, <clears throat> well, I know in, in the Marine Corps, it doesn't matter if you had a concussion, you weren't out, you were back in, in the game the same day or, or the next day, and yes, it does have a, a cumulative effect. Um, so on, on, on the sports side, are you now finding maybe the NCAA, if they, some of the bigger sports, asking, have you had <coughs> injuries prior to, and now they're making that decision, it just isn't safe for you to play. It doesn't matter how much you want to play, but based on your history, you may have had three or four concussions, it just isn't safe. I think that that's changing as well. I think that if people are returned to play properly, they can have five, six, seven concussions as long as they're not returning to play with current symptoms so they put themselves at risk for second impact syndrome, which is very, very serious. I think Dr. Schaefer would agree with me that we see people with multiple concussions and people get very scared about returning their son or daughter back to uh, collision sports or high-risk sports. But Again, if we're treating it properly, they're getting them back to homeostasis. And most importantly, treating the concussion throughout the entire day because that's not what we used to do. We used to say, oh, you're out of football, but go ahead and go to school, go to gym class, go do what you want after school. Now we're treating the concussion throughout the entire day because it's much, much different than an ankle sprain. We can see an ankle swelling. We can see the black and blueness. We can see a limp in their walking. With a brain injury, all we can really do is talk to them about what they feel and really recognize their symptoms sometimes as a practitioner, you know, visual disturbances, um, like, you know, some of the symptoms Dr. Schaefer was talking about, speech issues. So uh, I think to answer your question as well, I think there's uh, NCAA injury surveillance. I think when you take impact testing, it asks you right in the beginning a history of questions on how many concussions have you had. And some students will say, I've had seven concussions, but when you ask them, were those documented by a physician or a neuropsychologist, they might say, no, none of them were. So it's a very gray area with a history as well sometimes. But I think we have a lot of guidance with NCAA injury surveillance and where NFL is going and where Major League Baseball is going that it is safe to return people back to to collision sports and high-risk sports after having multiple concussions as long as they're doing it properly and not going back with any symptoms and making sure neurocognitive testing is back to baseline and making sure that they're having no symptoms with exertion. No more Eric Lindros? Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> and there are, there are some risk factors that I look for also to help make that decision. Um, it's tough because we've gained so much evidence and research in the last five to ten years, and yet uh, the <laughs> research is in its infancy. So... We have some pretty good evidence about two concussions or less being safe if treated properly. Three or more, uh, the jury is still out a little bit. Um, And again, yes, we're seeing data coming out of Pittsburgh that says five, six, seven, eight concussions. They're still returning athletes and doing very well. Uh, Again, also making sure that they don't have any of their certain red flag kinds of things that we look for that would say that's not a good idea. Um, My usual discussion in the office with someone who's getting into those multiple injuries is to say we don't have a great way of predicting when that one injury is going to happen that may leave you with something more long-standing or even permanent. Uh, So, you know, we have a serious discussion. I don't necessarily restrict them. Um, but I, I make sure you know, the athlete, parents, whoever is involved has, has a serious discussion, really thinks about it. <clears throat> but when you, you talk about head injuries, I don't, and you're making the point, but I don't think a lot of people really understand the changes. They may say, well, some of these changes are because the person's getting older or whatever. 
I go and I say, I can't remember anybody's first name. And they go, oh, that's just because you're getting older. But I go and I say, well, I have to learn different things about each individual so I can remember who that individual was. Or if I go, I'll look at, at you guys and I'll be going, I'll be looking at your face. And if your faces start changing, now I know the words I think I'm saying are not the words I am saying. And so you can pick up a whole, you can develop a whole bunch of clues and ways to hide a lot of the factors. But then again, we didn't have people like you. You guys get to notice and pick up some of the stuff. But there has always been plenty of ways to hide some of the um, side effects of these injuries. To hide and, and, and compensate, you know, to compensate and be able to go <coughs> forward with life even when you have had a fairly severe injury. Um, but ideally, that's what we are here for is to try and recognize the, I hate to say more minor, but, you know, to help recognize when we're still in that reversible concussion stage and make sure we treat properly to try and prevent some of these more permanent or long-standing brain injuries as much as possible. <clears throat> and like you're saying over and over again, you don't know if it's the third or the fourth and how it's accumulative. Um, but when you look at a bunch of these NFL football players, it seems somewhere around the age in, in their 50s, early 60s, it's, all of a sudden it just kind of seems to be overwhelming them, either just physically, mentally, or psychologically. So it isn't just a simple physical injury. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the reason for also trying to do away with some of the old terminology of the bell rung or... Uh, you know, it was just just a little ding. Um, we're trying to get rid of that so that we do understand how serious in the long term, how serious these injuries can be. Uh, and it's actually very helpful for us that the professional sports organizations are champion, championing this as, as well. So. And so <clears throat> on the school side, the sports medicines, what would be some of the things that you'd want a, a parent to be looking out for? I think when a kid comes home and they say, Dad or Mom, when I'm in math class, I'm starting to get a headache. Uh, when I'm at lunch, uh, I feel a little bit sick to my stomach and you know my appetite just seems off. Um, obviously, if we know they have a concussion, they're not going to be playing sports. So as they go throughout their day, um, parents need to be asking their kids at home when they know they have a concussion, How's your day going? Um, grades dropping are a big indicator. I think sleep is something that's changed quite a bit in recovery. We now want kids to get as much sleep as they possibly can, 10 hours or more a night when they're recovering from a concussion. If you recall, because you've had concussions, we used to wake you up every two hours. Yeah. I would, is it fair to say that's out the window? <laughs> For the most part, <laughs> right? yeah. And I think, you know, really just focusing on your kid throughout the day and not just saying, yep, you're not playing a sport after school. Everything else should be the same. And that's the real educational piece that I try to get out to coaches as I go to coaches' meetings. And if I ever attend parent meetings, I like to, to share that with them, that this needs to be treated throughout the entire day. Because if I use that ankle sprain example again, you can't see the brain, and it's a brain injury. So the only way to treat it is to ask the patient or ask the athlete or ask your son or daughter, how are you feeling, what's affecting you, um, and all those other things that I just mentioned prior. In so okay. for them, for the parents to be watching for, you know, headache is probably number one. So uh, trauma-related and headache, number one symptom. Feeling foggy is, is a common description that I'll get from the kids or feeling slowed down. Um, the mood changes like you, you talked mm -hmm. about. And then the rest, you know, the variety is as many different things as the brain does for you, you can hit any of those dis different functions. Some kids have just a ton of dizziness, uh, and that's their, their primary complaint to me, dizzy, balanced stuff. Some kids, it's a lot more visual symptoms. Um, so, but any of those uh, can be, or any combination of them, can still be a sign that that concussion is still going on. When you, <clears throat> when you talk about... Um Okay, you're not playing football. You're not playing the game. But sometimes there's a disconnect. Just because I can't play doesn't mean I can't have a, a walk-through practice 
or some of the other ones, like when you were talking about exertion. Like when we, at mine, I was shoveling the snow, and all of a sudden I just went dizzy and was almost, wait, what I'm just doing is shoveling the snow. And, and that was about three weeks after the concussion. And so you have to, you're, you're really emphasizing the point is if you, if you get your bell ring using one of those, you need to really limit your physical activity doing, to, to get the all clear. In my, you bring up a good point. My first question to our staff out at the high schools when they call about a kid and say, hey, their impact scores are off. Um, we, I think we need to talk to Dr. Schaefer about this or whatever it might be. And sometimes the parents say, well, we can manage this at the high school. You know, the, the impact scores aren't that off and the symptoms aren't that bad. But the kid ends up not ever getting that much better over the next week or two. I ask our staff, do the, do the parents and the kid really know what rest, rest, rest <laughs> means, right? Yeah. And a lot of times they don't. They might say, oh, we went skiing this weekend. They're a basketball player. We went skiing this weekend and they, they snowboarded and they went into the park and they had fun. Or, uh, yeah, they text all night until 10 or 11 o'clock and they're playing Xbox mm-hmm. till 1 in the morning on Friday night. That's not rest, rest, rest. Rest is, is something that really needs to be educated to the student athlete and the parents and they really need to understand what it is. And a lot of times that office visit that we set up, I think after they meet with Dr. Schaefer for 30 minutes or 45 minutes, they finally understand all of those things that are going to help that concussion speed up a little bit quicker in their recovery. So you're talking about <coughs> physical and mental rest. You got it. Brain, <laughs> brain rest and body rest. I will usually say that probably at least three, four, maybe more times during an office, office visit with someone. Um, it, you, anything that is really getting that heart rate up there uh, or really working your muscles or increasing blood pressure a whole lot, those things can be stealing some of that energy from the brain that the brain needs to recover. Uh, same with, you know, the brain burns a lot of sugar when you're working. Uh, and so really doing a lot of mental work or the light and motion of video games and, and those sorts of things can slow down the recovery. The most conservative way to treat these, and I use this occasionally when people aren't getting better, is called cocooning therapy. You go home, dark room, in bed, sleeping as much as you can, no TV, no video games, no nothing. Uh, If you come back and tell me you were bored out of your tree, you did what you were supposed to, um, you know, that's, that's the most conservative way to truly adhere to rest, rest, rest. Because I, because I know as a result of some of my head injuries, I, I I've had seizures. And if I walk into the TV room where my grandsons are playing the video game, it's gonzo in a matter of a a few seconds. So Mm -hmm. that wouldn't be rest. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so when you talk mental, now you're talking about the athletic side of the house. How do you work with the, the other teachers? If my kid's an all AP, honest student, they've got to do this homework, this, 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 and this. And I've got a big project coming in next week that's going to cut all nighters. That's not getting rest. I'm going to let Dr. Shaver talk about this in a minute, but, or, or briefly. But I think that. One piece of the puzzle that we have uh, in our program here that's really nice for the community is we really try to make sure the school nurse knows that the kids had a concussion as well, as confidentially as we can, and make sure that they know the kid has a concussion because if they come in during school Mm -hmm. and they say, you know, I'm really not feeling right, I'm not feeling well, I'm foggy, I'm dizzy, I have a headache, and the nurse doesn't know what's going on, a lot of times they might say, oh, it's okay, go back to school or go back to class or, you know, we'll send you home, we need to talk to your parents. And we just like to make sure the continuity of care is there and we've also met with all the school of nurses um, talking a lot of, uh, about what we're speaking about today mm-hmm. of how important rest is and how we need to treat it throughout the entire day. And it's also important for the parents to know that maybe they should speak to the teachers about, you know, if you are in AP classes, maybe you should talk to Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, their teacher, and make sure that they know that their son or daughter has been diagnosed with a concussion because we don't want their grades falling. We'd rather have them maybe doing take-home tests for a couple weeks or a week, or maybe we don't want them in a certain class that's going to trigger the headache. Uh, because if their grades are dropping, now it's affecting everything in their Stress. life. And then, yeah, and now we're dealing with mood issues as well, and it might, de- you know, again, 
decrease the recovery or amount of time or increase the amount of time that they have before they get back to doing what they really want to do a lot of times, which is sport and going to school and hanging out with their friends. Yeah, I think that's where, again, our program and having the athletic trainers in the schools mm-hmm. is very helpful also. That's another layer of communication uh, that we have, another layer of keeping everybody on the same page and trying to coordinate with administration and teachers and make the accommodations that we honestly need to make for these brain-injured kids. Um, I, I do everything from, you know, I, I try to walk the line as much as possible to let kids hopefully not get too far behind, but if their brain isn't recovering, we have to do what we have to do to adjust the school schedule and, and the school work. So it's, it's a tough road no matter how you cut it, uh, but obviously from my perspective, the brain health <coughs> kind of has to come first. Ten football games are the rest of your life. Definitely, yeah. definitely. <coughs> well, we've got about three or four minutes left. So is there anything that you really want to emphasize to, to the public? The biggest thing I want to emphasize is impact <laughs> testing and, and having it out in our community at our high school level, uh, 14 to 18 years old, is, is where we're at now with, with that. First of all, it's just a tool that we like to use, and it does give us objective numbers, but it's not the end all. A lot of people think that neurocognitive testing or impact testing is one of the neurocognitive tests that are most, what most people use, is the absolute best thing since sliced bread. And once their impact test scores are back to baseline, they're ready to go. That is certainly not the case. It's just a tool we like to use in our program. And um, we, f- we fund it ourselves to the high schools by a fundraiser that we put on. Um, and that's my first point. Secondly, um, we've had some feedback from the community about uh, the younger age group having access to impact testing. And, you know, the younger the, the athlete, the more... Can we football? Yeah, the, <coughs> you know, football. right, 7th and 8th grade football. So uh, we as a hospital organization are, are moving towards um, having that 11 to 14-year-old age group having access to baseline testing. So we're going to start working with a lot of youth organizations in the area like Cheshire United and, and Keene Knights and um, Keene Youth Lacrosse and, and start offering impact testing to them so that they, we have those tools available if those kids um, were to, to suffer a concussion because, as we stated earlier, the younger the kid, the longer it may take, um, as we know with current research, for them to recover from a concussion. So it's nice to have that tool in place. So very soon we'll have that available and it'll be up on our website and all that information will be very, very good for our community. And just FYI, uh, impact should not be done in anybody under the age 11. So a lot of people will call and say, oh, I have an 8-year-old. I want them impact tested. The current guidelines are, um, I guess, recommendations by University of Pittsburgh is that um, 11 and above is, for, is what we should be using that, that tool for. Okay. Most important things, I think, are recognizing the injuries and being willing to uh, tell someone about that as, from the athlete's perspective so that we can treat it properly and, and protect their brain for the long term. And the second most important thing, rest, rest, rest. Let the brain recover completely before you try to go back to regular life even. And I want to thank both of you for, for being here. Yeah. You were very insightful. And I'd want to be able to tell the guests, you can't be a macho egotist person because you're going to suffer some long-term consequences and we're not young forever and it catches up to us sooner than we, we'd want to so yeah. follow your advice if you get hurt see the doctor and follow their advice if it means rest it means missing a couple of football games it'll be well worth it in in your lifetime and so again thank you and for our guests we'll see you out there on the long road thank you thanks thanks